All right, hi everybody, welcome back to physics class. Um, today we're going to continue with our second day of uh, momentum topic here. Um, as you know, yesterday we talked about the introduction to momentum, how it is related to mass and velocity. Um, today we're gonna kind of talk about the second half of what comprises momentum. And we're gonna kick things off with the concept of impulse, okay, before getting into conservation of momentum. Uh, you might have seen this term impulse before in English class, right? Uh, impulse can mean something that happens very quickly or something that um, you don't require any thought to accomplish. In physics and the scientific world, impulse means something very specific, and it is very closely tied to the concept of momentum, and uh, it will actually relate the concept of force along with momentum, right? So force and uh, time or velocity uh, along with momentum, right? So this is still going to be a vector because uh, momentum is a vector, so therefore impulse also must be a vector, and it's simply the amount of force exerted on the object or the system times the time that the force was acting on it, right? So remember how last time with, um, with power, right? When we finished the concept of work, we introduced the concept, concept of power and that involved the amount of work done over a period of time, whether it was a short time or a long time. Um, here we just have the concept of force times time. So the equation itself is gonna be a little bit more simple. And let's take a look at what that looks like, okay? We are going to have a net impulse. Uh, that is because we can sometimes have multiple forces acting on an object or a system of object. And that's going to have a change in momentum. So before we just had a fixed value of momentum called P. And um, now we're gonna say, well, how did P change from an initial condition to a final condition? Um, this should be familiar concept to you because we have already done kinematics in which we would sometimes have a delta T or a T1, T2. Let's see how it applies to momentum. This is our equation. Um, most textbooks will use J as our variable for uh, impulse. Uh, some of them might use I. I personally enjoy using delta P. I think delta P makes the most sense. So when you do your own notes, um, you can use delta P instead. J is going to be represented by impulse imparted by the force F. Um, the force is the, uh, the F is gonna be the force in Newtons that will cause the impulse. And delta T is the rather short time period that that force is applying itself to your object. And we will simply multiply those two together to get our impulse. So really what we're gonna end up with here is our delta P, AKA our change in momentum is just going to be our force applied to the object times that small delta T, okay? You will see in a lot of our example problems that our delta T is going to tend to be very small, okay? So here is our, um, I know my face is kind of in the way here, but uh, delta P is basically delta F um, minus, sorry, delta P is basically P final minus P initial, okay? So as with every delta, we are taking the final quantity minus the initial quantity. So there's multiple ways you can look at this. You can look at it from a total F times T or from a PF minus P initial, uh, whichever one is most practical for your purposes. Okay. Now, again, I want to emphasize that impulse is just a change in momentum. So often you'll have one object that's striking a surface that is a wall or a floor or a single, or sorry, uh, a ceiling. Um, it could also be two objects colliding with each other. Right, so um, both objects could have different masses, they could have different initial velocities, but um, you know, for example, this one will have a small mass, large mass, they'll have equal and opposite velocities, but when they combine and crash into each other, because the momentum is conserved, which is a concept we'll talk about a little bit later, um, the total uh, combination of mass and velocity will be the same as it was initially, okay? So believe it or not, with our MV, right, 
Uh, this has a big M with the same V. So the total momentum of this system here is actually to the left, right? It is very slightly to the left, even though they're coming at each other, right? Uh, because the M2 has a larger mass. Now, after they collide, our momentum is still conserved to the left, and this will be very closely tied to the concept of impulse, because impulse will often be responsible for what is causing the change in momentum. Sometimes momentum can even stop, right? So um, here is an initial condition of our momentum. We have a mass, mass, both of them have a velocity. And like I said, one of the examples can be when it strikes a surface. So when they hit the ground, uh, what do you think is gonna happen, right? Well, this teddy bear is going to smush onto the ground. It's going to have a final velocity of zero, right? That is the key component here. Our final velocity will be zero. Uh, when our bouncy ball hits the ground, it is actually going to bounce back up with a, with a velocity that is completely opposite to what it initially had. So here we have a negative V going downwards. We're going to finish with a positive V going upwards. So in cases like this, you can observe a change in momentum. And uh, in this case, you can kind of use the P final minus P initial, right? So it's one dimensional, which makes things pretty easy. And uh, that is also one way to calculate change in momentum or impulse. Okay. Makes sense. And so, uh, yeah, there's some text here that's again blocked off. In the real class, we would not have this. <laughs> face in the way here, okay? Uh, just to show an example of how things look in different substances, okay? Uh, in this case, we have the same exact mass, but this time we are changing the type of surface that the bouncy ball is striking. So we're gonna see how the water will change the momentum of this object. We will see how some soft soil changes the momentum of this object. And we see how some hard wood would change the momentum of this object, okay? So as you can see, the impulse, again, let's try to use a, uh, oops, uh, let's try this, okay? We want to think about what happens during the impulse. Well, the impulse of the water and the soil is gonna be kind of the same because they're both fairly soft. Um, the reality is the soil definitely has a larger impulse because it is going in the opposite direction. So with the water situation, the velocity is merely slowing down, right? So here we'll have, you know, um, five meters per second minus the seven meters per second. So our delta P will still be negative, but it's not gonna cross over the border, right? Um, here, our final velocity will actually be in the opposite direction. So we would have a negative impulse, although a slightly small negative impulse. And with our wood, since the velocity is changing drastically, it's perhaps changing from uh, negative five to positive three, which is a total difference of eight meters per second. Um, it's gonna pretty have a pretty strong impulse. Okay, so you can test those values out for yourself. Okay. Hopefully you're ready for an example question at this point. Um, Let's say we do have a bouncy ball of mass m, okay? This is very similar to the exam pr uh, problems you'll see in the official exams. Um, it is initially moving to the right, okay? Towards a wall with a speed of two v, okay? So now the velocity, we can set it equal to maybe two meters per second. Uh, once it bounces off the wall, it's gonna have a speed of just v, okay? So what we want to know is what is the magnitude of the impulse on the ball from the wall? Now, in case you're having trouble understanding what that means, uh, essentially what this means is that this wall is applying a force onto our bouncy ball, right? Even though the wall is not really moving, right? The, the wall will exert a force normal Remember how we talked about the four different types of forces. Any force that comes from a surface is going to be defined as a normal force, okay? So this should be understood that the, that the wall is imparting a force 
onto this ball, right? Hopefully this is easier to see. And uh, even though we do not, we are not given a delta t, we still have the change in momentum. So I'll give you all a couple minutes to think about that. Right. I am going to give you the answer choices at least so that you have a little something to uh, think about. Now, this may be common sense for a lot of you. Um, in case it is not common sense, I will just rewrite the equation for you. Again, if you are ever confused, okay, just rewrite the same equation that we had above. We are not given the value of the force and we are not given a delta t, so we will use P final minus P initial. P initial. Okay. And our P final was negative MV. And our P initial was positive 2MV, right? Because we had the 2V. So if we actually subtract those, we would have negative 3MV. So the impulse, since it is a vector, okay, would actually be moving uh, to the left. However, they are telling us that they want the magnitude of the impulse. So apparently they do not really care about the direction that this impulse is going in. So we will just set our answer as 3MV. Any questions? All right. So as with most physics concepts, I do want you to be aware that there are um, graphical representations of this phenomenon. So we actually can graph the concept of force times time onto a coordinate axis, which will display the average impulse over that delta t. Okay. Now in real life, this is this red, um, red par parabolic looking curve here, right? So let's say, for example, you're playing baseball, your bat will strike the baseball. During this time, this graph is occurring, right? And it's going to bounce back with a different momentum, right, in the opposite direction. Um, this delta t here, as you can see, is going to be extremely small. It's going to be something like 0.01 seconds, right? Um, and in real life, this is what the force distribution is going to look like. However, obviously, when you do the exams, you'll have much easier shapes to work with. So this same uh, curve is going to be equivalent to this rectangle that we see here. This is the force um, average, average force. I don't know if we're able to zoom in here. Interesting. Yeah, we're not able to zoom in. That's fine. Okay. So um, this is very similar to the concept of work, right? So work, as we know, is force times distance. There was a graphical representation of that. And we will see something very similar over here, right? Because work was F times T. Sorry, work was F times D. Now we have impulse, which is F times T. So we can kind of do the same thing, right? If we graph the force of an, on an object as a function of time during which the force acts, okay, so what does that mean? That means force is going to be our output, whoops, or our y-axis, and time is going to be our input, which is our x-axis. Uh, we will end up with an f versus t graph, and this entire area, again, just like work, is going to be equivalent to the impulse. Okay. So the area under a curve that is f versus t will be equivalent to the impulse AKA our delta P. Okay. This might be a little bit difficult word, right? Uh, impulse imparted. Okay, so imparted just means it was it was pushed or provided by an external object. Okay. All right. Hopefully that's fairly easy. Um, another concept we want to keep in mind here is that this is going to be positive. Anything above the 
x-axis is going to be positive. Anything underneath the x-axis is going to be negative. Okay. So your textbook will show something uh, very similar in which we have a parabolic realistic uh, representation of force applied on an object. Um, and they can also be simplified to any sort of shape that's easier to take the area of, right? Because we, we can very easily take the area of rectangles, triangles, semicircles, circular objects, things like that. So we're not going to get into too much calculus in this class is basically what I'm trying to say. So let's test out this theory. Uh, let's say that we've got a toy rocket, which is mass of two kilograms heading off to the right. It's got an initial speed or velocity of 10 meters per second. And then there's a random force that is also in the horizontal direction, right? So this is, um, this is heading to the right. Our force is also in the horizontal direction, so there's no uh, trigonometric components to be taken care of here. Uh, we want to know what is the velocity of the rocket after 10 seconds have passed. Okay, so in this case, our delta t is pretty long. Um, it's a it's a continuous force that is applied for 10 seconds at least, right? So we want to know what is the velocity of the rocket at t equals 10 seconds. Okay, I'll give you guys a minute to work on that. <laughs> All right, hopefully you've had a minute to think. Now, this is a slightly longer problem, and it will flex your muscles a little bit here, but I will work it through with you, all right? Um, you want to kind of take things slowly here. So first of all, um, we want to set up our equation, right? So in this case, we have actually been provided our, let me choose green here. We have been provided a force times delta T, right, in the form of a graph, and we also really care about the initial and final velocities, right? So we're gonna flesh out our full impulse equation. That is PF minus P initial must equal our impulse, which is F delta T, okay? Now, what is our PF? Well, they gave us our mass, but they did not give us our final velocity, okay? The final velocity is actually what we're trying to find. So we will have something like mv final minus mv initial equals our force times delta t. So what's our force times delta t? Well, guess what? That's what's given in this graph. And the trick here is to understand that um, when we look at this triangle, okay, this entire whoops, section of the triangle, oh dear, uh, this entire section of the triangle and this entire section of the triangle, they're actually going to cancel each other out, right? Those are two uh, equivalent triangles, right? One of them's positives, one of them's negative, and so they're actually going to cancel each other out and give us a zero impulse over there. So we were really just left with this square uh, over here at the bottom right, and as we can tell, that is our that is going to be our f times delta t. So um, we'll just we'll just actually plug in those those numbers there. What is our force? That's negative 30, so negative uh, 30 constant, right? Times our delta t, which is two. Okay. Now we can plug in our numbers on the left left side as well. Uh, our mass is two, so that's going to be two times v final uh, minus two times v initial, which was 10. And all of that is going to equal this negative 60, right? And all we have to do now is solve for VF, which is what the problem is asking for. So we're going to say 2VF uh, must equal negative 60 plus 20. That's going to be negative 40, right? And so now once we divide both sides, we'll have VF 
must be equal to negative 20 meters per second. Okay, so by the end of this whole ordeal with this force acting on this rocket, um, our object is going to have a final velocity of negative 20 meters per second in the opposite direction. Okay. So that pretty much wraps up our topic on impulse. I am going to show you one more animation just to help you understand the graphical uh, side of things. Right. So this is when you when you think of impulse, you should be thinking of kind of a uh, a more a more rubbery, soft situation here. So the reason they used a large beach ball, for example, is because it's very easy to see with the human eye um, the force that the ground is exerting on the ball, right? Initially, the force is not very strong, but once it hits the bottom, that's when acceleration is maximized, and that is also when force is maximized. So it's going to have this huge parabolic uh, deal happening here, and that also replicates what's happening with our F versus T graph. Okay. So don't be intimidated by these graphs. It's just showing you on a macroscopic level what's going on. Sometimes if we see things like the, the baseball attacking the um, baseball bat, that would be a very microscopic situation. I might be able to show you a slide with that. Uh, maybe not. Doesn't let me go back. Never mind. All right. Uh, next up would be conservation of momentum, but we will do that in our next period class. Um, just take a look at the classwork for today, work on the next homework problems, and we should be good to go. Until next time.